Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Welcome to this midweek service with reflection, a short sermon on a very familiar gospel reading. First, we ask God to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may walk in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May all my words be in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This is perhaps the most well-known and quoted of all Bible verses, John 3, 16, that is. It's taught in Christian homes to infants on the knee and to our school and Sunday school age children. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's possibly the version that you learned, as I did as a child. It's precious to many of us because we believe and cherish the truth that God loves the world and that God loves us. And as Christians, we cherish the truth that God is love. Essential Christian belief about God is that God is good and God is great. That is, God is good and God is all-powerful. God's goodness and God's love can be seen as a matching pair. God's greatness refers to God's providence and power. With the development of a pandemic, however, these essential beliefs about God is being questioned by some people, even Christians. The pandemic and the personal experience of suffering, pain and loss causes some of us to question. It's the perennial question, actually, why does God, great and good, allow suffering? Theologians call this question uh, the problem of theodicy, that is, the justification of God in the face of suffering and evil in the world. We human beings, with our, all our inherent flaws, evils and selfishness, rightly hesitate to even ask such questions about God. But strangely, the Bible, our primary uh, written source of knowledge about God, gives us permission to, even, uh, to ask even the toughest of questions. Questions which are asked, for example, in the Psalms and the book of Job, or implied in the book of Ecclesiastes. 
The Bible gives us permission to bring to the Lord all our questions, doubts and fears, even those questions which could seem impertinent to us and which we know may rightly evoke from God the response that Job received to his questioning of God. Were you there from the beginning of creation and the world? Do you know the full story, in other words, of the world as God knows it, God the Lord? Who are you? Who am I to question God? We would be left speechless in the presence of God's power and superiority were it not for the fact that alongside God's greatness stands the evidence of God's great and wonderful love in Jesus Christ, God the Son, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. One scholar, Caroline Lewis, asks then why there is a range of reactions towards this verse, John 3.16, and this most famous uh, verse in the Bible. She's far from alone in recognising that this Bible verse is often taken out of context and that it's sometimes uh, used or misused in some quarters of the church. How so? Well, it would seem that the issue has arisen as the verse has become detached from its context of a nighttime visit by a curious and nervous religious leader. Nicodemus could well have been disillusioned about the religious belief he represented in the face of the hatred and hostility he saw unfolding before him in his own community as this self-appointed teacher and rabbi Jesus was being steadily persecuted and lovelessly pushed onwards towards his end. Nicodemus had questions which he needed answers to. He needed the reassurance that Jesus gave him that in spite of being so poorly represented by some religious people, nevertheless, God loved the world and the evidences in the giving of himself in his son and representative Jesus Christ. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. God has shown his great love for the world, literally the cosmos, and for us human beings, whom he in his grace treats as friends, in spite of the worst of our human qualities and leanings towards lovelessness, and treachery in spite of the fact that the image and reflection of God in us that we carry is so distorted and hidden often that our reflection of God uh, and of uh, uh, who is love is very poor and feeble. But God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's a word, a first word to Nicodemus, first and foremost. Nicodemus, a privileged religious leader then, needs to hear that God loves the world and God loves him. And as Lewis rightly remarks, so do the disciples, which is why in the next chapter Jesus takes them to the world, to a small town in Samaria, in Sychar called Samaria, so that they can meet who the world is uh, in their time and day. In the disciples' context, as Jesus was showing them, It was, the world was, the Samaritans. Samaritans who were the world which God loved and gave himself for in his only begotten son. Samaria, populated mainly by people who didn't believe what the disciples had been taught to believe about God, about the Messiah and about future events. These were the people, according to Jesus, whom God loved as well as the disciples. How shocking that God should love people who are not like us, who don't think like us, and even who are our enemies. This is the heart of John's Gospel, both in chapters 3 and 4, and it's the heart and soul of the Gospel full stop, which we have inherited and treasure, the Gospel of the love and grace of God, shown in the giving of himself in Jesus Christ, God the Son, God incarnate, the Son of God, who loves me and gave himself for me. If we, like Nicodemus, are doubtful or disillusioned by what we see around us, this word is for us too. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. This verse should be heard as divine assurance and an invitation to receive God's love and to participate, to take part in spreading the gospel of God's generous love, which is for everyone. John 3, 16 and this whole discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus confirms to us, as the writer and preacher Mida Stamper puts it simply and well, that God's intention for the dark, confused world is not condemnation, even when it lifts up the sun and crucifies him. On the contrary, in that moment especially, the sun will be the saviour of the very world that does not know him. How then are we to respond to this gospel? Perhaps best in fresh repentance and with a fresh expression of personal faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. God of peace, you teach us that in returning to you we shall be saved. By the power of your Spirit, lift us to your presence, where quietness and confidence shall be our strength, and where we may be still and know that you are God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect of the Day Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us always. Amen.